God is going to do something special uh, in our lives tonight. So good to see each and every one of you here. Thank you again, Pastor Michael, for the invitation, and uh, so good to be here. Always wonderful to be here at Praise Assembly. Uh, Sharon sends her love, and uh, we thank you for praying for her. Uh, God is doing a work in her back, and uh, uh, just, you know, she, she, she does not let anything stop her and uh, continues to, to go and uh, do what God's called her to do, just on a different level as well. But we thank you for your prayers, and we appreciate all of that. Uh, two weeks ago, we were in South Africa, and um, for the dedication of the, of the, the orphanage, the Seek and Save Hosanna Center, but also uh, we were able to visit six schools in two days, and we saw 5,600 gave their hearts to Jesus. And it was just simply amazing. And especially one school, we saw something literally supernatural, and it was captured on, on, on the video camera. And I want to share that with you. Um, it was a stifling hot day. It's summertime there right now. And um, very, very hot. The children sitting in the sun. It's a wind still day. No breeze at all. And uh, although it was early morning, it was already uh, uh, deep in the 90s. And um, very interesting. It was all wind still. And when I grabbed the microphone and started the altar call, when I asked him, I said, if you want Jesus in your life, would you put up your hand? You want to be included in this prayer. The moment their hands went up, the wind started to blow. Now, our, our, our camera has a wind uh, shield that it does not pick up wind normally when it blows, but it's on the camera. You can hear it. And then once again, when we started to pray and they joined me in the prayer of salvation, the wind just kept blowing. And we all saw that even our banner uh, flapped in the wind. And then when the prayer was done, the wind was gone. There was no wind again. It was wind still. And it touched the pastor's heart as well. And, and, and we captured that on video. And just want to share with you, is it okay if we take you to Africa public schools for a few minutes? You're ready to travel, don't need a passport or visa or anything. But um, uh, this is a public school in uh, uh, the, the uh, state of Limpopo in South Africa, and uh, we give God all the glory. Um, you'll see how eager and, and passionate these children are when they hear of Jesus. They want their sins forgiven, and they want a Savior. So go ahead and play the video for us, and let's rejoice together. Now, if your hand is up, you will be included in this prayer and you want Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. If your hand is down, you do not want to pray this prayer. This is not a prayer that is forced on you. It's a, it's a, a, a prayer that you pray out of your own heart. So, if you do not want to pray this, put your hand down. But if your hand is up... You will be included in this prayer. Now let us pray together. Let's pray aloud that God knows we mean serious business with Him. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus I, come to you today. I come to you today. Lord, I have sinned. Lord, I have sinned. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Set me free. Set me free. Jesus, be my Lord and Savior. Jesus, be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving me, Jesus. Thank you for loving me, Jesus. I love you back. I love you back. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Children, are you happy? Yes. Yeah. Are you really, really? 
I'm Pastor Juan Brits from Focus Dio in Mori Mali. And I just want to say, say thank you very much for what you are doing. We are at the school here. I'm in a classroom right now. And I just want to say thank you for all the sponsors. You know what just happened this morning? The moment, the moment uh, Rudy started to pray, the exception pray, prayer, a wind started to blow over the children. It's like the Holy Spirit just blew over the children the moment they gave their lives to Christ. And, and the wind is gone again. And, and I just want to say thank you. It was so touched my heart so much and to realize that this is the work of the Spirit working inside of their hearts. And I want to say a great thank you from, from our church, our local church here in South Africa, Mori Moli, and we are in the town next door. And I just want to say, may God bless you. And, and we are thankful for what God is doing through you in South Africa. Now, don't worry, we have enough books for everyone. So, I want you to just stay seated where you are. The educators are going to help us distribute the books. We will bring the books to you. And uh, then we will take a few pictures with uh, your permission and we will show all of our friends in America how happy you are. <laughs> Hallelujah. Isn't God good? <laughs> you know, the Bible says everyone that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you've just witnessed how they're calling on the Lord. But it's supernatural. Um, these are public schools. I'll, I'll re I remember uh, going to a Hindu school in South Africa in a different region. And uh, the, uh, we asked permission from the principal and said, please, can we, can we come and share? And he, he said, um, you know, on one condition, he said, if your message must be inclusive... Now, I knew what he meant. You know, uh, in Hinduism, they have uh, six to eight million gods, depending on who you talk to. And so, they want everything included. Um, you know, uh, Jesus says he's the only way, but they have many. So, they don't have a problem of adding. Uh, they just don't want to exclusive, uh, you know, that, that whole thing. And, and, and I looked at him when he said everything must be inclusive. I smiled. I said, sir, the message that we're bringing today is the most inclusive message there is. The Word of God says that everyone that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone. Nobody's excluded. And he looked at me. He said, that sounds good. A and he gave us permission. And uh, he said, but you've got to keep it short. These children, we have, we have discipline issues. They will not listen to you. Uh, they, will, they will not co cooperate. They're very, very, very bad kids. They will not do anything you ask, them, ask of them. So keep it short. Good luck. And he turns around and walks away. And I, uh, Sharon and I are kind of standing there. And um, Sharon walks up this platform at the school. And I hear her pray loud. And this is her prayer. She said, Lord... Prove this man wrong in Jesus' name. And I quickly amened. Hallelujah. I wanted to be in on that prayer. And as she walked up the platform, I saw the platform. There's this plaque on the platform that says, Sponsored by the Hindu Youth League of South Africa. And I thought, that's just God. You know, here we are on a Hindu platform preaching Jesus and the, sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Only God can do that. And you know what? As the kids came in, it was a school of a thousand kids. They had white uniforms and we needed them to sit down on a dirty concrete slab. And uh, you know what? We did not have one issue. They came in class by class, sat down, was so obedient. I mean, they played the game with us, very disciplined, no problems whatsoever. And then when we started to share the gospel with the drama of Seek and Save, you could hear a pin drop on that concrete as they were listening. They were riveted to the message. And once again, I, gave, I, I, I got the microphone and I, I challenged them. I said, hey, if you want to share, to, to serve Jesus, you, and no other gods, but Jesus, 
uh, because He's the Savior and He wants to, to touch you and remove your sin and forgive you. If you want to pray that prayer, put up your hands. 98% of those kids gladly pray that prayer, receive Jesus into their hearts. And you know what? Afterwards, we gave the books out and the principal... Uh, called Sharon to, to his office, and I thought, well, I better join her because she's never been to the principal's office. I was. <laughs> I know what goes in there. You know, I was not going to send her alone, so I walked, I walked in with her, and he was, he was completely stunned, and he shook her hand. He said, you are a very, very good storyteller. And uh, uh, he said, I've never seen a show like this. This is an amazing show. You're a good storyteller. It must be the intonation of your voice that these kids listen so much to you. And Shannon said, oh, no, sir. It is Jesus whom we serve, whom we spoke about, that caused them to listen. Then he quickly changed the subject, spoke about cricket and all, of the, all, all other stuff. He didn't want to hear that. But you know what? He witnessed the power of God and the miracle that the Lord has done. The gospel is... It's the power of God unto salvation, folks. And you know, it's not a very difficult message. It's a message of love, that Jesus loves us. So I want to encourage you to share Jesus wherever you go. And uh, just share the good news of Christ because He is our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. Turn to someone and say, smile, Jesus loves you. That's part of the gospel right there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Early this morning while I was praying, I asked the Lord uh, a question concerning this church and the ministries here, you guys. Uh, I said, Lord, what do you want me to share with the people of this house? And this is what God gave me. And I typed it out because it's important to me, uh, what God says, and uh, I'll send it to pastor. But this is what God said. He said, son, remind them that I am the author and the finisher of their faith. I do not initiate and activate and then frustrate and fluctuate. I will lead them all the way and not just halfway or part way. There are those weary of the way, but tell them that they will find what they need in me. All they need to do is ask. I have available all they need to succeed. For my people will see the strength of my hand and the power of my spirit. I will lead them where they have never thought they could they would walk. See, for I replace spiritual boredom with adventure, frustration with joy, challenge with breakthrough. So challenge them not to lend their ears to the musings of man or the inf be influenced by the messages even in the media, but to filter everything through the good news of my word. For I shine my light in dark places, so many will see and come to me. Encourage them to have my praise in their mouths and my word, the two-edged sword, in their hands. And to my servants say, I handpicked you for my purpose and your destiny is not and will never be in the hands of man. See, for I am opening bigger doors, giving greater opportunities that is connected to your destiny. Your influence will grow and not diminish. And I will cause your voice to be heard even when other voices are drowned out by the enemy's noise. While others love to make comparisons, you will make faith declarations that will activate many breakthroughs says the Lord. Hallelujah. We give God all the glory. And Father, we pray for praise assembly, for every uh, uh, member, every family connected to this house. We pray for the ministries here. We thank you, Lord, for what you are doing, the amazing, extraordinary, 
ordinary work of your spirit right here in this place. Lord, we thank you that the reach of this church goes around the world through missions and all their efforts. And Lord, we pray that you will bless every family connected to this house, that you will bless the leadership, that you will bless the pastors, that God, that they will experience your hand, your favor upon them like never before. We pray, oh God, that this community will experience the joy and the glory of what you're doing here among them. We pray in Jesus' mighty and holy name. Amen and amen. Take your Bibles, if you would. Let's go to the book of Luke. Going back to Luke, uh, but this time two chapters earlier, Luke 5. Luke 5, and uh, we're going to read from verse 17. Luke 5, 17. As you turn, I want to just uh, mention to you uh, this uh, two-minute daily devotional that I wrote called Gems for Your Journey. I don't know about you, but I'm busy. Everybody's busy. Uh, you just look at 95 early in the morning, people are going. Uh, and they do all kinds of things uh, in their car on their way to work. Well, I, I, I'm giving you something extra to do. Um, a two-minute daily devotional. You know, Getting the Word of God into your life is very, very important. We have to build our lives on the Word of God, but you have to do it in a consistent way. And so the Lord laid on my heart to write this devotion. Uh, I take a verse from Scripture and then give a nugget of truth to think on and contemplate. And uh, all in a two-minute, you know, it takes you two minutes basically to, to read this. And uh, I believe it'll be a blessing to you. Um, it's a daily devotional for devoted yet busy Christ followers. And so um, if you're interested, you can stop at the table. Also, Sharon and Jeffrey Nordeen, a friend of ours, an extraordinary pianist, they, they put their talents together and, um, and 13 of the, the old-time favorite classic hymns um, and uh, into one CD, and it's called It Is Well With My Soul. Well, two years ago, they won Song of the Year at the Gospel, the Enigma Gospel Awards with this, this CD, actually with It Is Well With My Soul, and that's available as well. And uh, uh, a CD that has not been available for, many, for a long time, uh, is now again available, Worship with Angels, just a prophetic CD, just powerful time. So avail yourself of those ministry resources and all the proceeds go to Seek and Save. I want to speak to you tonight about above expectation, above expectation. Just before I read, uh, let me start with a testimony. We were in Salt Lake City doing a meeting kind of just like tonight. And um, at the end of the sermon, I gave an altar call, and this young man came walking down to accept Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he looked like a fish out of water, as if he, he did not quite know what to do and what to expect. And so I wanted to talk to him, and afterwards he, he told me what was happening. He said to me, he said, I'm an atheist, or I was an atheist coming into this place. Did not believe in God, did not believe that there was a God. And um, I interrupted him. I said, now, if you're an atheist, why did you come to church? He said, well, I liked uh, a Christian young lady, and I wanted to score brownie points with her. So I decided to go to church or come to church with her. So they were sitting in the back, and he said, you know what? In my mind, I was mocking the whole time. When you guys started to sing and clap hands, I mocked. I said, huh, they're singing about nobody. There is no God. They're clapping, they're lifting their hands to nobody, I, you know, just as an atheist would. And, and he said, and then afterwards, um, you know, it was, it was offering time, and I said, yep. That's what it's all about. Money, 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 money. And, 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 you know, he mocked and he mocked and he mocked. And he said, then when you got up to preach, 
I really started to mock because the stuff that you were saying about God and he does not even exist. And he kept mocking and kept mocking. And he said, then something happened. When you invited people to put up their hand to receive Jesus, I was mocking in my mind when I, when I looked up, my hand was raised. So I'm mocking everything you're doing in my mind, but I see my hands up. And now I'm telling my hand, put yourself down, but my hand does not want to listen. And then when you said, if your hand is raised and you want to be included in this prayer, get up and walk down the aisle because I want to pray for you personally. He said, I found myself mocking in my mind, thinking there's no God. What are you doing? You, this is stupid, but I'm walking down the aisle. I could not help myself. He said, and I don't know where it was, but somewhere... On my way to the front, I had an encounter with the one I did not believe in. And right there, the atheist became a believer. And that night, he was even baptized in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> he did not expect that. God gave him above expectation. More than what he expected. My question to you is, what do you expect from the Lord tonight? He is a God that will give us above what we ask, pray, think, or imagine. And I want to show you out of the practicality of the word exactly what God wants to do. So let's read verse 17, Luke chapter 5. Are you ready? Good. One of those days, as Jesus was teaching, say teaching, there were Pharisees, say Pharisees, and teachers of the law sitting by, who had come from every village and town of Galilee, of Judea, and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present with him to heal them. Wow. One of those days... Jesus was just minding his own business, preaching, teaching, doing, sharing, doing what he does, speaking the gospel, the good news of Christ, of himself, being the Messiah. And the Bible says the whole place were packed. They were a great crowd. But it's interesting, the Bible identifies only one group of people there. In the audience, we know the disciples were there. They were, they were the Jesus groupies. They were already sold out, gave everything up, loved Jesus with all their hearts, and, and, and they hung on every word that Jesus was saying. We also know there were other followers of Christ there because they believed in Christ. They wanted to hear. We know for a fact that there were many who were convinced Jesus is the Savior in the audience. But the Bible does not single them out. The only group we know the Bible says was there is the Pharisees. And I thought, man, this would have been such a great story. Why do we need to know that the criticizers, the naysayers, the mockers, the unbelievers were in the crowd? And God started to speak with me. Even Jesus did not have the perfect audience. Think about it. Even Jesus had the Pharisees to contend with. You think you are working in a tough situation where there's not everybody uh, uh, believing Jesus that you're working with. You think that your neighborhood is kind of a tough situation. They're, you know, they're from everywhere. I don't know, even know if they go to church or not. You know, it's tough. It's hard. It's, it's difficult to share good news. Jesus did not have everyone say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. As a matter of fact, he had active opposition in the audience. You say, well, okay. But I want you to look at the rest of this verse. The Bible says, even in the midst of an imperfect audience where there's a group 
of people coming right out to oppose Jesus, the power of God was on him to heal them. You don't have to wait for a perfect environment for the power of God to be activated. Oh, you're not getting this. Even when there's doubts, even when there's people not believing, it should not influence you because of who they are and what they believe. The power of God is not geographical. It's personal. So that's amazing because the flow of power tonight is not dependent on you or me. <laughs> Hallelujah. You can activate God's power regardless of who you're sitting next to. Regardless of how, whatever's going on, the power of God is personal. Jesus said to his disciples, he said, you shall receive power when my spirit comes on you. Not when you have the perfect audience. Not when everybody agrees with you. Not when all your stars line up. Not when your ship comes in. Not when, you're, when, when, when you, ha you, you, you have the perfect family going. Not when you have all your ducks in a row. Uh -uh. When my spirit comes on you, that's when you will receive my power. And that's what's happening here. The power of God was on Jesus while he's teaching. It was a teaching moment just like this. And there was power present to heal. Man, I love this. Now think about this. Jesus is teaching. And the anointing on him is activated. And now he's still flowing in teaching, but God is about to do a healing. You see, you could start on one level and end in a completely different level. Let's be sensitive to what God wants to do tonight. I might start off teaching. You might start off listening. But somewhere along the line, the power of God is going to be activated on a level. Maybe it's healing. Maybe it's filling. Maybe it's touching. Maybe it's deliverance. Maybe whatever it is, God, all we want is your power activated. That's what we want. Wherever you want to take us, take us there. Hallelujah. Now, the, the Greek word for power here is dunamis. Dunamis. The dunamis of God was on him to heal them. Dunamis. There's a, there's, there's a lot you could say about dunamis, but let's skip on because I want to stop in this word heal. There was power present to heal. God's power is always connected to a purpose. God will never manifest his power to show off. See, I'm God. That's not God. He doesn't need to show off. His power is always connected to purpose. The purpose in this meeting has changed from teaching to healing. I wanted to see what type of healing this is, so I looked up the Greek word here used for healing. And it's the Greek word aieomai. Aieomai. And I found out there's really two words in the Greek language, in the Bible language, in the New Testament language that speaks of healing. We have therapeo and aeomai. And so therapeo, that's where we get our word therapy from. Therapy, therapeo. And, and whenever God heals through therapeo, there was a process. God would touch a person. That person had to respond by doing something, and together it worked. God spoke to the man at the pool of Bethesda. He healed him, and then Jesus said, Go sin no more, that not something worse will come upon you. The healing there was therapeo, so God did the work. The man had to agree with and do something on his end. He had to change his lifestyle so that the healing sticks. That's therapeo. So if you, if you go to a therapist, 
The therapist will tell you what to do. And if you do what he says or she says, there's a partnership going on and therapy is happening. Now, how many of you know God is the best therapist there is? And sometimes God comes into our lives, He sends His Word, He speaks to us in a therapeo session. He says, do this, and we respond by doing in obedience, by submitting ourselves, and then healing happens, and boom, we have this dynamic partnership, beautiful, wonderful, supernatural, thank you, Jesus. But that's not what is described here. Where he says there's power present to heal, it's not the word therapeo, it's ayeomai. And ayeomai is hard to, to describe to you in one word in the English language because it's such a, an amazing word. Um, ayeomai literally means to make whole. It means um, something like this, healing through a burst of divine power. So, where therapeo means I have a role to play. God's doing the work, but I have to respond to what He does. And there's this partnership going together. There's, there's this synergy between me and God. And we work together, and boom, we have it. Ayeomai is more God, not me. How many of you know sometimes we just need a burst of power from heaven to touch us? An Ayeo my moment. You've believed everything, you've 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 received everything, you're with your back against the wall, God. Whew, just do it. I believe with all my heart the atheist in Salt Lake City had an Ayeo my moment. Where he did not even cooperate. In his mind, he didn't know what he was doing. In his spirit, he yielded, but God touched him. God got a hold of him even before he believed. I don't know how that works. But then somewhere he encountered God and he started believing. Ayeomai happened. The power of God. A burst from heaven. Boom. The wind of the Spirit blowing on a public school as they give their hearts to Jesus. That's supernatural. It's powerful. I believe tonight we can have an Ayeomai moment because of what God is about to do. Do you believe God still touches people? I want a touch from heaven. So he says the power was present to heal. Hallelujah. Everything is set. Now look at this. <laughs> I love this. Verse 18, and behold, some men were bringing on a stretcher a man who was paralyzed. Say paralyzed. And they tried to carry him in and lay him before Jesus. Now, here's the reason for the change in the anointing. They were the reason. Jesus set out teaching, but God knew someone is bringing someone that needs healing. That need, there's a need that teaching will not help. We need a different anointing. And so these people are bringing their paralyzed friend. I looked up the word paralyzed. It literally means feeble or weak. Feeble or weak. And um, it's, it's written in the perfect passive participle. <laughs> How many of you know if you're paralyzed, you're perfe perfectly passive? You're not going anywhere. Even the grammar is, is, is descriptive of his situation. We don't know what he went through. We don't know if it was an accident. We don't know if he was born that way. All we know was he was laying on a stretcher. He could not walk, could not move. He was immobilized. He was paralyzed. And when I saw that, God started speaking to me. He said, Rudy, what areas of your life are perfectly passive when it comes to me? Did you know that the enemy of your soul wants to paralyze your faith. Faith without works is dead. He doesn't want you to move around. He wants you to be perfectly passive in anything connected to faith. And God started speaking to me. He said, what in your life is perfectly passive? Huh. I needed to do some, some introspection. And I needed to to repent and say, oh God, 
I, I'm not as active in you as I thought I was. And I want to encourage you tonight, God is about to change things around. I believe tonight God is going to activate some things in our lives, hallelujah, that have become passive, that have just become dormant, that have not been working the way it should. Turn to someone and say, wake up, the good part's starting. You getting something out of this? Look at this. They wanted to bring him before Jesus. That's the best place to do it. Bring him before Jesus. Verse 19. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd. Say, because of the crowd. They went up on the roof and lowered him with their stretcher through the tiles into the midst in front of Jesus. How many of you know people will always get in the way? You can ask anyone that does not go to church anymore in America, they will have someone to blame. They might blame the whole church and say, bunch of hypocrites. What happened? They let the crowd come in the way between them and Jesus. This is exactly what happened to these four. They're bringing the man. They couldn't get in because of the crowd. And I want you to know that the devil will always position people between you and Jesus. Don't let people offend you because of Jesus. Don't get people in that lane. Don't let them interfere with your relationship with Jesus. How many of you know people will disappoint People tend to get in the way. People have a lot to say. Just the other day, someone said to Sharon, if you had any faith, you wouldn't have any pain in your back. (laughs) I thought, oh boy, you said that to the wrong lady. But you know what? I was so proud of Sharon. She gave me a a, a report later on. I wasn't there. She said, I said, what did you do? She said, no, I wanted to do something to her, but I, I, instead I said something to her. I said, what did you say? She said, I choose to ignore what you just said to me. I said, man, you let her off light. <laughs> but then I remembered this. You cannot afford to put people between you and Jesus. When people get in the way, when there's no way to get to Jesus, when you cannot take your passivity to God, find another way. Find an- What did they do? <laughs> they went to the next level. They couldn't get in on this level, so the Bible said they went up on the roof. What does that mean? Think about it. They were down here with a ceiling above their heads. The roof is above their heads. There's a limitation. There's something above here. And so they couldn't get there because of the crowd. What did they do? (laughs) They made the ceiling their floor. Oh, you're not getting this. It's time to go to the next level. It's time to elevate, folks. It's time to be pulled up spiritually by our faith. Find the stairs and make yesterday's ceiling today's floor. Hallelujah. Years away to Jesus. If you cannot get to him here, get to the next level. Find a way. Hallelujah. I love this about these folks. They needed to get their need before Jesus. You don't lay your need before the feet of men. You lay your need before the feet of Jesus. Because he's the one that can touch you. He's the one that can do it. They elevated. They, they went to the next level. I love what they did. And then the Bible said they broke the roof. Hallelujah. That's a great thing, except for the owner of the house. I wonder what he was saying. Praise the Lord. This paralyzed man was not living up to his potential. Couldn't do anything. He needed good friends. Thank God for good friends. Hallelujah. Here's a a clue. Get friends that when you cannot do anything, they will carry you to Jesus. 
Hallelujah. Turn the ceiling into a floor, a limitation into an opportunity. Hallelujah. You always have to remember it's easier to lower your burden down than to lift it up to God. If you're down here, you got to lift it up. If you're up here, you can lower it down. Use gravity to your favor. Get to a place spiritually where you can lay it down. You don't need to lift it up. Jesus says, cast your cares and burdens unto me because I care for you. Hallelujah. I love this. Now look at this. Suddenly, all eyes are fixed on the problem. Here's the, imagine for yourself, the stretcher coming down. I mean, interrupting the teaching moment. Jesus is already aware of the power to heal. And boom, here's the guy coming down on a stretcher. He's paralyzed. Everybody probably recognizes him because he's the one where they have to pass. And he, he's begging every day, asking for alms, asking for bread, asking for this. And now they see him coming down right before Jesus. Every eye fixed on the problem, except Jesus. The Bible says this, verse 20. When Jesus saw their faith, everybody sees the problem. Jesus looks beyond the problem. He, he wants to see something else. <laughs> he saw their faith. Can I ask you? Is your faith visible? When God looks at you tonight, we want Him to see our problems. But you know what? He first wants to see something else. He wants to see our faith. Because that's what his, his first connection will be. Is your faith visible to the Lord? You say, Rudy, how, how, how is faith visible? Faith without works is dead. Their faith was demonstrated in their efforts to bring the need to the feet of Jesus. Hallelujah. What will you do to demonstrate your faith to the Lord tonight? Will you do something? Listen, you're here already. Surely that's an act of faith. I hope you did not come to hear a man with a weird accent. Because then you're already disappointed. But if you've come because you believe God's going to do something, hallelujah, that's an act of faith right there. And you know what? God sees it. And if the moment happens where we worship the Lord, what, what's worship? Worship is an expression of our faith. It's a... It's an act of faith. God saw it. You see, we need to put our faith in action. Many times people think about faith and this, and they make all kinds of statements. But you know what? I know my wife has an amazing amount of faith. <laughs> Even though she's got pain in her body, she's got faith in the Lord. Hallelujah. And I, I have no doubt in my mind, breakthroughs coming to her body. Praise God. We have seen cancers healed. We have seen MS healed just up the road here. We have seen blind eyes open. We've seen broken arms fixed in eight minutes supernaturally. I believe in miracles. I believe with all my heart. But you know what? People think faith is this theoretical superpower. No, 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 no. Faith is simply stepping in and doing what God wants you to do. Believing, saying hallelujah, worshiping the Lord in the face of adversity. Doesn't matter what's coming against you. Your eye is fixed on Jesus. Your heart is fixed on Jesus. No circumstances no devil from hell can move you away from Jesus. You believe, you stand on the word of God, and your actions speaks of it. That's faith. That's faith. Jesus sees their faith. Wow. Now look at, look at this. Everybody's probably thinking, oh boy, we're going to see a miracle. We're going to see a miracle. Because they see the paralyzed man and they know Jesus can do it. He's done it before. So, 
Jesus sees their faith and he says, man, your sins are forgiven you. Wait, wait a second, time out. Lord, that's not really what we need right now. We need a miracle of healing, not the miracle of salvation. The four friends brought their, fr their, their unbelieving friend and they would expect a healing miracle. They would be okay if God just healed him and send him home. Unbelieving, paralyzed man could go home an unbelieving, healed man. That was their level of expectation. Just heal him. This is what we're bringing to you. But I tell you what, God does more than what we expect. Their expectation is healing. God ups the ante and he says, I see your faith. Now your sins are forgiven. <laughs> Woo, glory. Did you know that's the biggest miracle of them all? Salvation. If somebody comes in and offers you a choice between a Rolex watch and a Casio watch, which one are you going to pick? <laughs> a Casio $8.99 at Walmart, Rolex $59,000. Which one will you pick? If you pick the Casio, you need a healing prayer. <laughs> I pick the Rolex every time. Sell it and print 89,000 books. Hallelujah. But why? The two watches does the same. They keep time. Doesn't make any sense. But you know what? It all depends on the price. The price. Which watch is more, worth more? It depends on the price paid for it. Now, healing was paid for by Jesus with the stripes on his back. Isaiah 53 says, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of the world was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. In other words, Jesus paid with the blood coming out of his back as they flogged him 49 times. They said that beating was so brutal that that many people would die because of that, but Jesus lived through it. He paid with the raw wounds, blood gushing out of his back. That purchased our healing. It's a steep, high price, no doubt. But salvation was bought with a higher price. He actually had to hung on the cross and die. That's a steeper price. Many of the disciples were flogged, beaten, bruised, blood flowed. But you know what? They couldn't purchase our salvation. Only the blood of Jesus on the cross as he gave up the ghost and he said, it is finished. That's the highest price. So what's more important? What's the greater miracle? Salvation. Then healing. Healing was just with the wounds on his back. Salvation was with his life. Are you, are you getting this? So here they are. Jesus says, hey, you know what? I'm not just going to give you the little miracle you need. I'm going to give you the best miracle I can give. Your sins are forgiven you. Wow. And then the Pharisees, I knew it. We're going to hear from them. <laughs> they were arguing. Who is this man? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Duh. God is in their midst and they didn't even know it. 
See, if you're critically inclined, if you're negative-minded, if you're, you're full of criticism, you're in the very presence, the most holy presence of God, and still miss it. That's what happened here. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus, knowing their thoughts and questionings, answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? He says, Which is easier to say, Your sins forgiven or arise and walk? <laughs> Which is the easier one? Well, salvation was the more difficult one because he had to die for it and then be raised from the dead three days later. Look at this, verse 25. And instantly, well, Jesus said, Arise, pick up your litter, your stretcher, and go to your own house. And instantly the man stood up before them, picked up what he had been laying on, and went to his house, recognizing and praising and thanking God. I think it's time that we carry what has been carrying us all this time. I love this. He, he carries what carried him. And then the Bible goes on, and he, he says in verse 26, look at this. Overwhelming astonishment and ecstasy seized them all, and they recognized and praised and thanked God and were thrilled with and controlled by reverential fear and kept saying, we have seen wonderful and strange and incredible and unthinkable things today. <laughs> we have seen strange, unthinkable, wonderful, incredible things today. That word strange doesn't fit there. So I looked it up. The word strange here, when they say we've seen strange things, literally means above expectation. Things we did not expect. Our level of expectation was here. <laughs> God came in on this level. He blew our minds. Praise God. They wanted a healing. They got sins forgiving and healing. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We were in Montana. A lady who was unable to get a uh, driver's license because she was legally blind in her one eye. She was in the meeting. And as we were ministering, the Lord kept telling me, just nudging me by His Spirit deep inside that that, that there's someone with, with migraine headaches that God wanted to heal. And, and, and I kind of just put it off, put it off, but it became so strong I just couldn't anymore. So I just said, hey, hey folks, uh, this is what I get. God says there's someone here, you've been struggling with migraine headache, one migraine headache for a very long time, and God wants to touch you. Who is it? And this lady gets up. She had this one migraine headache for six months, nonstop. The doctors put her under, uh, you know, like in surgery, to try and figure it out. But when she comes out, still headache. Nothing they did could get, take care of the headache. And, 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 and just debilitating. She couldn't work anymore for six months. Imagine six months, one headache. And so she came out... We laid hands on her and we said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And so she went and she sat down and we went on praying for other people. A few minutes later, the headache has lifted. Gone. And she was just so excited. My headache's gone. First time in six months. So we rejoiced with her and we dismissed the meeting. We went home. The next night we were back for, for another meeting. She's back. And so immediately I asked her, I said, how are things going? She said, oh, uh, wonderful. I have no headache. But something else, when I woke up this morning, I, I saw this, these strange shadows in my legally blind eye. I don't know what to make of this. And I said, well, let's pray. Let's pray. So we prayed again in the name of Jesus. Be healed. So we did the meeting that night. She went home. The next night she came back. She said, funny thing now, I see images in this blind eye. 
I said, praise the Lord, progress. We're going to pray again. So we, we laid hands on her again. We prayed. The following night, she comes. She says, I see full color. It's so wonderful. When I woke up this morning, it was so great. I went to the DMV and did an eye test and passed. I got, here's my driver's license. She was legally blind. Now she could see. Did the eye test. You know, she believed God for a migraine miracle. God healed her blindness as well. That's the God we serve. She wanted a headache healed. God took blindness from her as well. Aunt Mary, let me tell you about Aunt Mary. Just when I started out in ministry, I was still actually in Bible school, the, the angel-making factory. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's what they told me. Bible school. So I, 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 I didn't know much about ministry and anything, you know. I just started out as, as youth pastor in a church. And then our pastor went on vacation. And uh, it was a smaller church than this. And uh, my pastor said, now you're going to do everything, you know. Uh, you, you're it. I said, okay, what do I do? He said, well, you stand at the door and greet everyone as they come in. You're the usher. I said, okay. He said, then you and Sharon lead them in worship. You're the worship leader. I said, I can do that. He says, then you take the offering. I said, okay, I'm the, 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 the liturgy man. I can do that. And he said, then you preach. I said, I can do that. He says, and then you go back to the door and greet everyone on the way out. Remember, you're the usher. You're it. I said, hallelujah. I can do this, pastor. So he goes. So I'm standing in front of the, of the door outside before the meeting starts. And Aunt Mary, one of our dearest, dearest intercessors, uh, tremendous woman of God came in or towards from the parking lot and I could see pain on her face. And I said, Aunt Mary, what's wrong? And she showed me her arm. Her arm was swollen about three times the size of the other one and I could see the two bones broken, twisted. She fell and broke her arm. Swollen three times the size. She's in a lot of pain. And she says, Pastor, I need you to pray for me. I said, Aunt Mary, I'll pray for you immediately. But then we're going to the hospital. You broke your arm. That needs a cost. You, we need the doctors to check, it, check this out. She says, yeah, yeah, but, 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 but I just want you to pray for me. I said, I, I'll pray for you. Let me pray for you now. And then we get Sharon to take. No, 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 no. I, I first need to hear the word of God. I said, Aunt Mary. So she's, she's having this discussion with me. I said, okay, Aunt Mary, uh, whatever you, you want, you, I'm going to pray for you. Not here, not here. You're the usher now. <laughs> I want you to pray for me at the altar during altar time. I said, okay, I'll do that, Aunt Mary. Uh, and, and, and then we, I'm taking you to the hospital. And she said, okay, that's fine. So that morning I'm preaching. I'm preaching a strong evangelistic message, and I give an altar call for people to get saved. And I had one response, Aunt Mary. I knew she was saved. I knew she wanted prayer for her broken arm. Nobody else came. And I'm thinking, oh, okay. So Aunt Mary comes out, and very gently, I just laid my hands on her. I did not even pray for healing. Because I, in my back of my mind, we're, we, doctors are going to fix this. We're going to the hospital. So here's what I'm praying. Bible school student, not knowing anything, but knowing that she's in pain. I said, Lord, please take this pain away in Jesus' name. That's all I prayed. Aunt Mary walked back to her seat. We sang the last final song. About eight minutes after the prayer, dismissed the people. Now I'm looking for Aunt Mary because we're going to the hospital. And Aunt Mary comes walking down the aisle with a smile on her face. I said, what, what, what's up, Aunt Mary? She said, look, Pastor, look. And she shows me uh, uh, her arm. There's no swelling. There's no breakage, nothing. And I said, uh, show me the other one, Aunt Mary. And she shows me the other one. She said, it's healed. It's healed. Eight minutes. 
The swelling went from three sizes down to normal. She picks up stuff. She, she does stuff. I'm saying, Aunt Mary, that's a miracle. Then I started thinking, what, how did I stand? How did I touch her? What did I say? How did I project my voice? I need to bottle this. I need to... <laughs> See, that's not how God works. Miracles don't work that way. We've seen that. You know, I expected God to just give her relief until we get to the hospital. <laughs> that's my level. God comes in here. Can I ask you, what is your level tonight? What are you expecting God to do for you? It's okay to expect. It's okay to have an expectation. Listen, when someone's pregnant in South Africa, we say she's expecting. How many of you know you can only expect for about nine months? Then you're going to deliver. Hallelujah. If you put an expectation on God, that's part of your faith. And you believe, God, I thank you. You're going to touch. You're going to come through for me. Listen, if we have faith that says Jesus forgives me of my sin and my faith is strong enough to take me out of hell into heaven, that's basically what our faith does, <laughs> then anything is possible. With God, all things are possible. All things.